Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. The hour is coming, it is now here. In spirit and in truth, let us worship God.
The Gospel lesson is from the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as a scribe's. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Our hymn this morning, uh, before the sermon, is new to us, but I imagine that you will uh, likely recognize the tune. I chose it first and foremost because it, it does go well with the gospel this morning. But this hymn is also a pairing with the period of the title of the sermon this morning, The Exorcist. Um, the Exorcist came in, out in theaters in 1973. The tune of this uh, new hymn was released by the rock group The Animals in 1964. You want to guess what that was? House of the Rising Sun. Uh, so we're going to stand in with all nostalgia. Matthew and Luke open their story with the birth narrative. 
for the Christmas story, uh, but John and Mark do not. But then all four Gospels agree that when Jesus grew up, he was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan, and then immediately spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness to prepare for his ministry, and being tested on the desert. And they also agree that when he returned from the desert, he called his disciples, and then immediately launched his public ministry. But they disagree again on how he launched it. Each Gospel has a different story. The Gospel of John says that he launched his ministry by going to a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Actually, he missed the wedding and got there in time for the reception and changed the water into wine. Matthew says the first thing that Jesus did was to climb a mountain and, and preach uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount, reminiscent of Moses on Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. And Luke says that the first thing Jesus did was go to his hometown in Nazareth and preach a sermon that got him kicked out of town. They nearly were lynched him. So then, that leads us to Mark. According to Mark, the first thing Jesus did was cast out demons. And whereas I like the way the other Gospels begin their narratives, I'm not sure that I like the way that Mark begins his. My problem is that I try to be a modern, educated, sophisticated person. And modern, educated, sophisticated persons don't believe in demons. So I feel uneasy when people around me start talking about demons. But if you read the Gospel of Mark, you're, you're going to read stories about Jesus beating up on demons. It happens in the other Gospels too but not to any degree that it does in the Gospel of Mark. But according to Mark, the very thing, first thing that Jesus did as Messiah was cast out a demon. So being the opening act in Mark's story of Jesus, casting out a demon serves as the theme of Mark's Gospel. Jesus has come to cast out demons from this world. And I realize that for many of us that kind of uh, saying is awkward, maybe even embarrassing, because I don't think I'm the only one here who tries to be sophisticated. So uh, I suggest we examine this story a little more closely. According to Mark, Jesus enters the synagogue at Capernaum, and there's a man there who is very ill, very disturbed. It's obvious that he's possessed by a demon. And the first thing to notice in this story is that no one in the synagogue recognizes who Jesus is except the demon. And as soon as Jesus enters the synagogue, the demon cries out these sentences. Who are, who, what are you doing here? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Have you come to destroy us? And I like to imagine the scene in the synagogue this way. Have you ever entered a darkened room, turned on the lights, and seen the cockroaches scattered? <laughs> if you have, I realize you're probably not going to admit it here among your friends. But it's a perfect image for understanding who Mark says Jesus is. When Jesus, the light of the world, comes into the darkness of our world, the demons who thrive in the darkness, scatter. That's what's being announced here. In Mark, the demons are those who hold us captive, like fear, or hatred, or prejudice, or compulsion, or addiction, or greed, or shame, or anything else you have to live with that prince prevents you from knowing the life that God has created for you. Now I began to say that we are modern educated persons and that means we're supposed to live our lives rationally. And in the modern rational world there is no place for demons. The modern world began about 400 years ago in what was called the Enlightenment. And that's when it was discovered that reason through reason, human beings could understand the physical laws that structure the world. 
And that discovery that the world is run by laws, discoverable by reason, was the beginning of science. And through science, we could make our world and our lives better. So by the 19th century, human beings were able to use the laws of nature to do amazing things like build railroads that conquered the land, or steamships that conquered the sea, or generators, electric generators that pushed back the darkness, or scientific medicine that brought healing. And life just kept getting better and better like that through the 20th century, with the invention of airplanes, and then spaceships, and then technology with radio, televisions, computers, smartphones. I mean, talk about miracles. Talk about new lives. Talk about a new world. All brought about because of reason, not religion. No wonder churches are declining in membership. Though you all up here on the mountain haven't experienced that, I noticed. But the world that we live in today, the 21st century, is generally referred to as secular. And to call it secular is to announce the victory of science. Because secular means there is no reality beyond what you can see. What you see is what you get. Which is not a problem for modern men and women because we've conquered the world with reason. We're in control now. There are no more supernatural powers, no more demons, nothing that we cannot conquer. Except in the movies. And there the demons are all over the place. You notice that? That, that the public entertainment in a scientific age is stories about being attacked by demons. Now, I've never seen so many supernatural evil powers threatening civilization as there are in popular entertainment. And I suspect that I know the reason for it. In spite of science, in spite of the powers of reason, in spite of the triumph of technology, we still see that there are powers that overwhelm the lives of individuals and ruin their lives. Even the most sophisticated people, even the best educated people, succumb to powers that destroy their life. Like drugs. We've become a nation addicted to drugs. You know how, how this rational, modern, sophisticated nation explains the drug epidemic? It blames it on Mexico. It says it's their fault. You want to get rid of drugs? Build a wall. Keep those people from bringing in those evil things into our country. You and I know there's only one way to stop the flow of drugs into this country. Stop using them. And if you can't do that, if a nation cannot use reason, weigh the facts, consider the consequences, then there's something greater than reason that has a power over us. We won't blame that on demons, I'm sure. We're too sophisticated. But it's significant that the psychologists, the psychiatrists, the theologians, the philosophers, those who think deeply about the human condition, will use the adjective demonic to indicate a power that can control us and can destroy our lives. There are other demonic powers in our culture, like violence. You watch public entertainment, and the message is very clear. The way you handle conflict is through violence. And that's been a part of the American myth for a long, long time. It was a plot of every cowboy western movie that I saw on Saturday, Saturday matinees in my local theater when I was growing up. Every movie pitted good against evil. And every movie resolved the matter with a duel, with a gun. <clears throat> That's the American narrative. Violence, a gun, 
always solves the problem. And now in this generation, we don't see many movies about cowboys. Cowboys have been replaced with action heroes, they're called, who beat up people, blow them up, zap them, disintegrate them. We watch movies where men and women use automatic weapons to kill scores, even hundreds of people, or to kill alien creatures. And we call that entertainment. And then periodically, too often nowadays, someone enters a school or a theater or a church or a rock concert and imitates what he sees heroes do on the screen. We were all appalled again last week for what happened in Florida. But I read that there have been 18 school shootings this year. If we can't control violence in our society, if we can't build a better way to live, then violence has become bigger than we can handle. It's become demonic. The latest national scandal is sexual harassment. The fact is that our culture is saturated with sex, even with pornography. It's everywhere. Is now available to everyone, even if you don't want to see it. It's there. The evil of pornography is that it portrays women as objects for men to dominate. So is it any wonder that in the workplace and in society as a whole, that women are not treated with the dignity that God gave them in their creation? Sexual harassment is just another of the evils that has taken on demonic dimensions in our modern, rational society. So the Enlightenment got rid of demons, but the demonic remains a force to destroy life for millions of people. Now go back to the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is casting out a demon from the man. The demon immediately recognizes Jesus. I know you, Jesus of Nazareth. Have you come to destroy us? Jesus doesn't say anything. But the answer is yes. Jesus has come to redeem the world. Redeem means to restore it to the way it's supposed to be. To restore it the way God intended it to be in the creation. To restore your life to the way God intended your life to be when God created you. And he's not going to do it by zapping all of the demons who hold us in captivity the way the superheroes do. He's going to do it by calling the church to reject the spiritual forces of wickedness. You recognize that phrase? The spiritual forces of wickedness. That, that's in your baptismal vow. Probably most of you were baptized when you were infants, and so you didn't hear it there, but you were asked that question when you were confirmed. You were asked, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? And we say that instead of demons because we don't want to scare anybody. But it's the same thing. Spiritual forces of wickedness are the demonic powers that hold people from the life that God created for them. And Jesus came to get rid of them and then commissioned his followers, the disciples, to follow him in doing the same. So to be a disciple, according to your baptism, is to join the struggle against the powers that threaten the goodness of creation, like the misuse of drugs and the worship of violence and the oppression of women. So how do we do that? Well, unfortunately, in American culture, the church has pretty much been labeled irrelevant in fighting the demonic forces, and that's because of the puritanical image that has been given to church people. Sometimes, I suppose, church people deserve that. But in fact, the term church person itself is often shorthand for prudishness for being a Puritan, it's like H.L. Mencken's famous quote, 
that a Puritan is someone that has this haunting fear that someone someplace is having a good time. <laughs> well, the movies invariably picture church people that way, as puritanical, as irrelevant, especially the preachers. The preachers are always a bunch of wimps. But the fact is that historically, the church has taken the lead and shaping this society for the good. I, I was happy to come across a column written by David Brooks, who alone among all the social commentators had made this point. He wrote that for most of American history, mainline Protestants, that includes the Methodist, set the dominant cultural tone. And that most of the big social movements, like the abolitionist movement, the suffragist movement, the civil rights movement came out of mainline churches. And besides that, he said that mainline Protestants created a culture that united people. It brought people together from different backgrounds, different religions even, to work together to solve society's problems. The first efforts in in his social work, for instance, were done <coughs> by church folk back in the late 19th century who saw the inhumane condition that immigrants were suffering in the tenements in New York City and other eastern cities. And they also saw the exploitation of workers in the factories at that same time. And they did something about it. Not only did they minister to their personal needs of hunger and clothing, but passed legislation that stopped the exploitation. And finally, Brooks pointed out that in those years, the whole culture was influenced by the Protestant ethic of hard work and the development of moral character, the idea that you find life by striving for the highest. And in a time when the secular world's image of the good life is the pursuit of whatever it is you want to do. The church's mission remains the same, to love our neighbors and to live personal lives of decency and dignity and worth by following the teachings of Jesus. Years ago now, Margaret Halsey wrote a satiric novel about the American suburbs. It, it, it was called uh, the, the Demine Paradise. It was a novel critical of what seemed to be the culture of American society back in the 60s. The neighborhood church in that novel was called St. Euphoria. St. <laughs> Euphoria's pastor was Reverend Aspirin. <laughs> and the mission of St. Euphoria seems to be sprinkling holy water on the status quo, whatever is happening now. And the result was a community without guidance from any standard other than from what is happening now. And one character in the novel, in talking about her church, said this, how do you keep the standards that you believe in? How do you keep from getting corrupted when nobody is around to symbolize the higher things? Well, in this world with demonic powers that destroy the goodness of life for so many people, the mission of the church is the same as it was in the first century. We renounce the evil powers of this world and pledge our allegiance to the highest that we know, to Christ and his kingdom. stand together now and affirm our faith. We believe in you, O oh God, eternal spirit, Savior and Creator, and to your deeds we testify. You call the world into being, you create persons in your own image, and set before each the ways of life and death. In Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Savior.
your church to accept the cost and the glory of discipleship, to be your servants, to proclaim the gospel to all the world. You promise to all who trust you forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace.
for Bob Eilers, Jennifer Hendrickson. May the knots that we tie in, the prayers that we lift, bring healing of body, mind, and spirit for these. And for others whose names rest on our hearts, be they out of joy or with concern, congregation, I invite you to say those names aloud now. God, hear our prayers, for you are our presence and power. Forever be with us as we journey with you. Help us to make a commitment of our lives, our spirits, our hearts, to be in ministry for you. As we join together in the prayer that Christ gave to us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven,
receive the benediction. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.